Great. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thanks for inviting me. What a great topic. And I so enjoyed listening to the three previous speakers. Very, very inspiring. And so, um, yeah, and I, I, as a caboose, um, maybe this is another opportunity to explore different perspectives and viewpoints. Um, maybe uh, initially a few words about Apis Arborea and about who we are. We are uh, located in California, USA. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization that promotes holistic pathways of honeybee conservation, research, apiculture, and innovative watershed centric programs for the protection and regeneration of local populations of honeybees. Um, our comprehensive ecological framework integrates innovative conservation models while emphasizing the intrinsic value and agency of all life forms. Uh, Apis Arborea's work centers around three main interventions. That is restoration and conservation. We are having a few conservation programs with small family farms and other things. Education like the salon and research. Um, you can reach us at the web address there below. I want to just touch, touch in briefly on our main research project that is situated in Northern California. It is called the Galbraith Wildlands Research Project, where we study wild naturalized Apis mellifera in a remote bioregion. This project as a whole is also has a special, special focus on interdisciplinary collaboration. We are always inviting in other interesting parties and stakeholders to join this project. It is um, owned by Sonoma County, Sonoma, Sonoma State University, and it's about 3,600 acres, and which then are surrounded by thousands more of privately owned wild property, wild uh, land. Mm, just maybe a little bit more information about where we are currently. Um, this is the nest density within Galbraith. By the way, we in the we consider Apis arborea as a novel wildlife of the Americas. Um, having been three years into this project, we have uh, also, like Fabrice mentioned, bee lining. Um, we located 35 trees so far and uh, 18 more areas uh, with, with non-identified bee trees. And that gives you an idea of nest density. So one could say 5.5 per square mile is probably the minimum in that area. Um, those numbers are representing the West Coast in California, and you can compare that against numbers at the Arnold Reserve and Thomas Seeley study. And those numbers were probably, we are probably at um, double the amount, twice, twice the, the numbers. So, now, as um, Steve, you already mentioned, uh, I am, I find it quite interesting uh, sometimes to step back and look at the premises on which we work and also uh, define and develop programs. So wild versus domesticated frameworks are powerful in that they lay out our field of research and perception. They determine what is thinkable and what is not thinkable. Um, and therefore, we are caught in bin binaries, in dichotomies, wild versus domesticated. Uh, and that generates a certain kind of thinking, right? Versus, we, we could also uh, frame this as ecologies governed by beekeeping versus by sympoetic systems. And sympoetic here is a novel word that refers to collaborative interdependent mode of existence where entities co-create and mutual influence each other's emergence and behavior. So novels, novel perspectives is something I would like to bring into this conversation. Um, novel perspectives in conservation and life sciences think in terms of networks and interdependencies to represent highly complex systems. And uh, we, as we all know, we are all lost to our love of honeybees in one way or another. Um, you know, being insect and mammal, 
honeybees are transcending binaries and dichotomies. So that is for us, we kind of have an advantage of uh, working and having bees in our life that kind of intrinsically are, is already holding that, that points towards alternative pathways of perception and things like that. So shifting beyond contemporary metaphors to explain and explore the world of honeybees. And I wanna now go through a few and I'm pretty sure I will run out of time. One is called Actor Network Theory by Bru developed by Bruno Latour, examines how both human and non-human entities influence and shape social networks. It emphasizes the agency of non-human elements, considering them as active participants in creating and maintaining these networks. Another one is called Nature Culture Web from the field of science studies, feminist theory and anthropology and environmental humanities that have challenged the conceptual framework that separates nature from culture, human from non-human. And then, of course, in this context, we have to talk about the holobiont, uh, representing a paradigm shift in biology. It refers to a host organism and its complete ecological community of symbiotic microorganisms living within and on it, forming a functional unit of life. And then in the same context now, we all are so ingrained and used to a thinking in terms of individuals, even within the field of honeybees, you know, um, Patrick talked about meta populations, but who, who is the individual here? And, and in, in new movements within biological sciences, um, the biological individual is the pivotal across genetics, immunology, immunology, evolution, analogy, and so forth, shaping how data is integrated within these fields. But recent analysis have disrupted these traditional definitions by revealing extensive interactions between animal, plants, and symbiotic microorganisms, blurring established boundaries of individuality. What do you say to that uh, when that what we take for granted that also represents the very foundation of what we all do is actually put um, into a new context that 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 uh, opens up new perspectives and earth system scientists sciences are going in the same direction i have to skip here a little bit because i'm running out, i will I run out of time um, so and then of course the human and other than human beings this the topic of going beyond the human this conceptual conceptual shift towards a other than human world goes beyond the cross cultural understanding of nature and instead challenges our ability to comprehend modes of existence that destabilize the boundaries of self and the social the organic and inorganic the single and the multiple and many more deeply rooted conceptual binaries. And um, one more of those concepts, um, which have been developed by Karen Barad, she calls it intra-action, and that throws kind of almost everything we know <laughs> out the window, um, which suggests that entities emerge and take shape through their ongoing mutual entanglement, where their boundaries and identities are continually co-constituated in the process of interaction itself. So each of those would, re would require a whole day of discussion, but I do believe it is of utmost importance to, to increase our awareness for that was happening in the periphery because the future is being born right there, I would say. And how can we recenter towards an animated world where in the context of honeybees, now we also integrate, for example, their conation, agency, and sentience. And conation, I just learned as a word which I find quite powerful. And I wrote the, the definitions here as the capacity to generate responsibility and motivation to take moral action in the face of adversity 
and perseverance through challenges. And really the question here is how much does that is a, is a factor in natural selection and evolution, for example, same with beauty, for, you know, just to you, mention. So got one minute. All right. So how can we integrate principles of mutual entanglement and non-binary perspective into our human and scientific inquiry? Uh, that's all what I'm trying to do is here with you is to share my own questions with you all. And, but some people try to answer those. For example, Otto Schaumer from MIT by developing Theory U, which integrates very different um, modes of operation, modes of being for problem solution and, um, and development of, of innovative models, whether that is for conservation, you name it. And also uh, a more um, indigenous approach that is called two-eyed seeing um, that is, uh, one can say, a requ requisite guiding principle in collaborative, transdisciplinary, transcultural work and integrative science. And uh, I want to end with just marveling and enjoying for just a few seconds this being in its expression in this particular tree that is part of the Galbraith project. Um, in all its emanations and also in all his their unknowns because that is all that is visible from the outside and um, to share with you that um, survival rates with our limited data we data set we have collected at Galbraith is right now uh, probably at over 82 percent or so so and that's it thank you for witnessing me rushing through all those points. <laughs>